Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks, for the intro. thanks for the intro, Tim. Um, yeah, so um, I'm looking at this, as Tim said, from two perspectives. One, as a, as a scientist or former scientist uh, who did a lot of work and thought a lot about information on the internet, how this affects uh, people's behavior. And uh, this problem really is as old as the internet itself. So, and, and we have struggled with that uh, question since the mid nineties at least. Um, also the question like, how, how do you even define what's accurate information and what's credible information? And um, so as a scientist, I've looked at those questions. I'm now a publisher, so we publish 30 peer-reviewed journals. So we are also in the business of kind of deciding what is accurate, what should be published in a scientific journal, what constitutes evidence, what, uh, what do we want people to, to accept as, as evidence. And... Um, Uh, yeah, I can't share my screen here. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I coined this term infodemiology uh, almost two decades ago um, when thinking about these problems, what is accurate information, what is credible information. And uh, back then, uh, I defined this as a new research discipline and methodology uh, which studies the determinants and distribution of health information. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I also did some research, and that was way before Google, for example, published Google Trends. Uh, we were interested in the question, what do people want to know? What are they searching for? Um, and also, how does it, this uh, possibly correlate with public health events, for example, influenza outbreaks. Um, so the, there was a um, paper which I published about the correlation between flu-related uh, searches on Google and um, Google actually converted that idea into Google Flu Trends a couple of years later. And so that is also one aspect of infodemiology. Next slide, please. And uh, we had a pandemic a couple of years ago, the swine flu pandemic, which was really the first pandemic in the, in the social media age. And um, back then I also did some work uh, studying what, what people um, publish on Twitter and what, what they talk about. Uh, next slide. Uh, I don't have time to go into those details, but um, this gives you just an idea of what kind of analyses are, are possible. So you can do like a cross-sectional analysis of what the topics are people are talking about. Next slide. But you can also do like long, longitudinal anal analysis, for example, studying how uh, the sentiment about certain topics changes over time, or even the use of terminology. So back. Back then in the swine flu uh, epidemic or pandemic, um, there was a shift in terminology. WHO recommended not to use swine flu anymore, but H1N1. And you can, for example, track how, how whether or not and to what degree uh, the public um, uses uh, these new terms. Next slide, please. So, um, the, the conceptual framework here is that with infodemiology, we want to study the information communication patterns on, on the web, which in turn reflect population behavior, attitudes, but also health status. And uh, if we feed back that, in, that information, that uh, these metrics, infodemiology metrics to public health professionals and policy makers, then we can help uh, policy makers and public health professionals to refine their messaging, uh, which in turn influences population behavior, attitudes, and health status, which in turn we can then measure again with uh, infodemiological methods. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so for that, we can uh, either study the, the demand for information that's out there, for example, by studying things like what people are searching for, or we study uh, the in information supply, so what's being published on web pages and social media, uh, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So there, there's now a really quite substantial body of um, publications in this area, and um, the, the journals we publish, which focus mostly on di digital health, uh, publish a good chunk of these studies. So almost every day we publish a new study, a, a new infodemiology study, and um, there, if you're interested, there's an, there's an e-collection of articles, which is literally hundreds of articles um, on, on the JAMIA website. And um, we also see the first uh, COVID papers coming out uh, where, where people study these kind of uh, questions. What are people talking about? What's the, what's the, uh, what are common misunderstandings, what are myths, myths, what are people searching for, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a selection of papers we have published in the past couple of days, really, about COVID and, um, and infodemiology. Um, What's maybe noteworthy is, is that last paper, um, which was also featured in the media about uh, Buster's website, so that, that also used a rapid online poll. Um, Günther, we don't hear you anymore. Oh. Okay, you're back on. Okay, sorry. I'm not sure what happened. I'm just going to continue. So um, if I cut out again, let me know. Um, next slide, please. So from a publisher perspective, um, our challenge is to get this information out as fast as possible and in scholarly publishing um, a lot has happened in the past couple of years in terms of acceptance of preprints. So um, that's one way of how we as scientists and as publishers can get information out faster rather than waiting for the uh, peer review process we can already um, put preprints up and as a publisher, we are doing this routinely. So when, when, a, when an author submits a paper to us, he can opt in into um, publishing their submission as a preprint, which will then be on our preprint server. And, um, and um, that helps with finding peer reviewers and it also helps to, to get the information out there as, as fast as possible. Um, also on acceptance, we have now the ability to, on the same day of acceptance, to uh, have this paper indexed in PubMed, and um, that's even pre-copy editing and pre-typesetting. The paper's already indexed and links back to the preprint, which in this case would be the accepted manuscript of the author. Uh, next slide, please. And there are other preprint servers out there. Just last year, MedArchive was uh, founded, uh, and, and BioArchive and other preprint servers have been around for uh, many more years. So this led to a concern that you know scientists are now basically bypassing peer review and just putting everything on preprint servers, which is not really accurate because most of what you find on preprint servers are actually manuscripts which are already submitted to, to journals and which are currently under peer review. Uh, so about 80% of, of the uh, 
preprints you will find on MedArchive, for example, will eventually be published. Um, but still, obviously, in the absence of peer review, um, it is a challenge for the public and also journalists to decide what should be reported and what shouldn't. And it is probably, in most cases, better to wait for the paper to be formally published before reporting about it. Next slide. So as a publisher, we also try some new models of peer review just to accelerate this process. So for example, um, we are hosting uh, virtual journal clubs about preprints, which then also, um, which, which then also uh, replaces or supplements the, the formal peer review process. For example, next week we're going to discuss one preprint about knowledge and behaviors towards COVID-19 about US residents. Uh, and uh, so that's a preprint that's published on Met Archive. We're gonna discuss it in a virtual journal club. And- Gunther, you have one minute to finish, please. And yeah, and uh, we'll then in all likelihood formally publish this, this paper. Um, next slide, please. I want to skip that slide. Next slide, please. So uh, in conclusion, so about the first part of my presentation, we have a lot of experience in building tools. Other people have built tools. Uh, I think what's missing here is um, kind of a input demiological preparedness in terms of having all these tools uh, available and I put up some ideas here what, what could be done for example maybe hackathons or uh, working more with researchers in the field uh, maybe create new WHO collaborating centers with academics who work in the field. Um, a second bullet, bullet point is uh, that at, in our view as a publisher, the antidote to misinformation is openness. So we are an open access and open science publisher. So we, we believe in the notion that transparency leads to trust and that the more open we are, the more data we put out there, um, the, the better the chances are that, that, that people will actually disseminate the, the the right information and, and, and draw the right conclusions from it. For us as a publisher, the main challenge right now is to, to find that balance between speedy pu publishing and evidence vetting process on the one hand and also rigor uh, on the other hand. And um, we're trying to find new models for peer review. Thank you.